Hello, everybody. Welcome to Who Looks After Water, a conversation about water's more than human guardians. We would like to begin by acknowledging that many of the people joining the call today are living on the city territory of indigenous nations. Us at Talking Rivers are speaking from the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee people, specifically the Ganyangahaga Mohawk Nation. In addition, those of us who are part of this colonial society acknowledge our role as settlers on this territory, honoring those who have lived in harmony with this land since time immemorial. For this event, we would also like to thank all the beings that make life on earth possible. So my name is Blake Lavia. My name is Sinsun Aguilar Itzo. And we are part of Talking Rivers, an organization that unites communities through art, science, and conversation to honor the rights of the modern human world. This program was founded in part by Humanities New York with support for the National Endowment for the Humanities. Any views, findings, conclusion, or recommendation expressed in this program do not necessarily represent those of the National Endowment for the Humanities. So tonight, in discussing the more than human guardians of water, we would like to introduce our speakers. Dr. Diana Bersford Kroger is a botanist and medical biochemist. Her books include The Global Forest, Arboretum Borealis, and Lifeline of the Planet, and To Speak for the Trees, among others. A featured documentary about her work, the Canadian Screen Awards nominated call of the forest, The Forgotten Wisdom of Trees, appeared in 2017. Stephanie Hildebrand is a self-taught photographer, environmental technician, and graphic designer. She's based on the banks of the Upper St. Lawrence River. Her personal work reflects on interconnectedness in nature, anthropogenic pressures, and natural processes in aquatic habitats. By combining her science and photography background, she hopes to inspire curiosity, conversation, and gratitude towards the river. And finally, Julian Matthews is uh, an enrolled member of the Nez Perce tribe that has a treaty with the U.S. government that encompasses areas within Oregon, Idaho, Wyoming, and Montana. As a tribal member, Julian Matthews believes in continuing to exercise the tribe's treaty rights and ensure that the younger generation will be able to do the same. In um, efforts to protect um, the treaty rights, they formed the nonprofit Ninipu Protecting the Environment to work on motivating tribal youth and adults to take action when efforts are made to take away or negatively impact their treaty rights. This discussion is going to be a conversation in which our panelists will answer questions and engage with each other in dialogue. Before we begin, I would like to invite the audience to drop questions in the chat function on the right bottom corner of your screens. We'll be asking the questions at the very end of the event. So now to begin officially with the program, um, we would like our panelists to introduce themselves and the lands and waters they call home. So I pass first of all the word to Stephanie. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you for inviting me and to be on this panel beside all these incredible people. Um, so I'm a settler based on unceded Gahaga territory, so Mohawk territory, um, what's known as Cornwall, Ontario, Canada. I live along the shores of the St. Lawrence River. My family originally settled on Anishinaabe land in the Laurentian Mountains in the 1960s uh, from Germany uh, with a bit of French heritage as well. Uh, we moved to Cornwall when I was eight years old and I've called the St. Lawrence home since then. Um, I was very fortunate and I think this is an important part of who I am, but I was very fortunate to have a, a curious mother who was interested in foraging and survival on the land. Um, and despite our short time here, that shared knowledge has helped me connect and feel empathy for all of our relatives and a term that I've learned from our neighbors in Akwesasne um, that I think is just such a perfect description of all of nature. Um, at the same time, I've always felt a need to express myself visually, which I think has become my best tool uh, to amplify those stories on this great river. 
And so currently I work as a visual communications coordinator for a not for profit uh, nestled on the St. Lawrence River called the River Institute. And so today I'll be speaking a little bit about eels and I thought I would introduce how I learned about eels and my relationship to eels. And so my first memory of eels goes back to moving onto the St. Lawrence River because by that time there were almost no more eels left in the Laurentians and in the Ottawa watershed. Um, and so my first memory was the end of summer around August when the grapes were ripe and walking along the shorelines and seeing dead and chopped up eels along the side of the river and so many, much more than we see now just because of that natural decline of the eels uh, by this time. And I, I never knew what was happening to them until I came back to Cornwall, um, you know, after going to school and traveling and doing these things um, and then learning about the eels. And now I've been very focused on bringing that story out to the public. So. That's me. Thank you so much, Stephanie, for your introduction. And now I'm going to pass the word on to Diana. I will introduce you in my from my ancient name. My name in old Gaelic is Oanani Dunsmerach, and the aristocratic line is on Vera. That's who I am. I am the woman also that the golden eagle flies over every day. And the whippoorwill protects me at night. That is who I am. You must understand that. From my background, water is sacred. The sacred name for water is Ishka, on Ishka. There was a greater protection for the great forests of the world at the time of Christ and before the time of Christ. And those great forests and the trees of the great forest, the sacred trees, the sacred trees were called on villa. The sacred trees were medicinal trees. Always the medicine was taken from those trees and used in the Celtic culture. The idea and the thinking and the ideology of the ancient Celtic lines is very, very close to the First Nations and all of the peoples of North America. And I've talked to the fire keepers and I've asked them if maybe the Irish, the Celtic culture did come across because we have legends, the legends of Antir and Nanog and the Bjotach in Old Gaelic, the people of the northern area are the people in Gaelic, on Bjo is life, on Toch is Tua, the people of the life of, of the north. So you can match the two, the two nations, if you want to think of it that way together, North America and Celtic culture. I am very, very interested in what is happening with botanically with the trees of North America. I have an arboretum. In the arboretum, I am saving and propagating and looking after all of the rare trees that are now endangered and going on the rare scale of North America. And to learn how to propagate these trees is very difficult. It is an art in its own and it's a science in its own. There's one tree down in Texas that I still have under arm guard. It is Petalia trifoliata chrysidifolia. There is one tree left. It is under arm guard night and day to protect it. I'm trying to propagate that and I indeed think that I will. There is another tree which is called the cucumber tree, which is the sacred tree of the Huron people. And the cucumber tree here in this area, there are only two of them left. I have broken germination of those trees and I know now how to grow them. These are very important trees, the tulip tree, magnolia, magnolia, the magnolia species. There are very, very few of them left. I'm also interested in all of the carrier species of North America. Once upon a time, a long time ago, on the face of North America, the peoples of North America were well fed from the carrier species. And that is carrier lacanosia, carrier ovata, and all of those hickories, their hickories I'm talking about. Now in the hickories, the oil of the hickory nut is a oil, an oil of medicine for the brain. And the people who ate that oil in a form of tofu and in a form of cheese 
had a very, very long life and were very healthy. So far as I know, in Canada, there is, there is a population and it is in my arboretum. I've spent 25 years trying to find the more northern species of those trees. I'm propagating them. And when I am finished all this propagating, they will all go back to the First Nations. They will go back to the people that have the rights of ownership on these trees and on also, also on, you may laugh at me, and the beans, different kinds of beans that were grown here that have nobody ever thought of protecting them as a secondary form of food. So I'm interested in that. Now, let me tell you a little bit, quickly tell you a little bit about how important trees are. Look at a tree. A tree looks like a lollipop. The tree is at the top of, e of evolution of the plant world. There is nothing better than a tree. And in fact, the genome of the tree is very closely re related to your genome, except for two bases on the genome. We can read trees, trees can read us. In the old laws of Unban Shankas in the Celtic world, the law of Unduchas, that is called the law of inheritance. You are the owners, the inheritors of the trees. You are the owners. We all own the atmosphere. We all own the ocean. Nobody just singularly owns one great forest. It should not be, and it should be for everybody. Now, your breathing today is you're listening to me, you're breathing in oxygen. Where is this oxygen coming from? The most important thing in nature is that nature paints with a paintbrush that is green. Green is chlorophyll. Chlorophyll is the product of, really, you have to think of the photosynthetic reaction. Too much forest has come down. There is too much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Trees are like lollipops. They soak up the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. <clears throat> they take carbon and water with the aid of the sun. And this is the photosynthetic reaction. From this, you get a compound which has got two hydrogens, carbon and oxygen. That's the beginning of sugar. That's the beginning of your food, my food, and all the food for the planet. Then there's water left over and the blessing of oxygen into the air. That's where it comes from. You cut down the forest, you reduce the oxygen. You cut down and lose the forest, you lose your medicines. And believe you me, the medicines in forests are the most extraordinary medicines that nobody who is an organic chemist can even make. We can't make them. It's divinity made these things. Not you, not me. It is divinity made it. And they're there for us. And the greatest divinity, the greatest Medicine is in the ancient trees. We have got to look after the ancient trees for, for our children, our children's children, into the generations ahead of us. We've got to do that. Now, by the way, just recently in the scientific world, they've just found that evergreens, the evergreens around us, do a flip with infrared. And the flip of infrared, and you're walking through an evergreen forest, improves your immune system and has a good hand at getting rid of COVID-19. So there are many, many things about forests and nature that we don't know, but we should know. And I think that, um, I think that forests, I know that forests hold water. They pump the water into the aquifers of the planet. There are five major aquifers on the planet and they're all going down. They're all losing the volume of water in, in the soil. We are going to be really up the creek fairly soon with this hot weather with a lack of water because we'll have a lack of snow and a lack of ice. We have got to solve this problem of climate change and it's very simple. My bio plan is the following. Every person on this planet plant one tree per person 
for the next six years and we will pull the carbon dioxide ratio in the air down from 400 and what is it 11 12 14 now down to the 300s and that re-regulates the weather and it buys us time to have some sense in our heads and some brains to go with it thank you thank you so much diana for your introduction and uh, all the words you said and now i'm going to pass the word to julian no oh, we no. can't hear you my video okay yes yeah okay yeah that's weird because i have another one but anyway okay um good afternoon uh, my name is julian matthews on uh, my so yeah put temp name i guess you call it and uh um, i'm an earl nez Perce tribal member and um <clears throat> i work with the coordinator in amy food protecting the environment and we work in our treaty area i've been doing this since 2017 my cousin and i elliot moffitt Another tribal member, some others started a group because we started looking at some of the issues, particularly the dams um, on our on the Snake River, which is within our treaty area. Like the intro says, we have a treaty of 1855 and we have reservation, but we still have hunting, fishing, gathering rights within the treaty area. And so, you know, I hunt and fish and with my brother and family and we've been hunting and fishing, gathering for, you know, long before the migration out west here. And so to me, I always look at how things have changed, particularly with um, the onslaught of cattle and how that impacts the environment, wolves, you know, other timber industry, cutting timber in our forest, national forest, not our national forest. It's like, really, we don't own it. I I was reiterating that to our tribal council about a month ago. I said, well, you know, who owns that river? And, you know, no one says nothing because no one owns it, you know, but the federal government and states, they think they own the land. They think they own the river. But they think they own everything and so which is really bad because then they kind of dictate to me what happens to it and so we have uh, <clears throat> kind of continuous battles with the federal government in protecting our treaty rights and so um that's kind of my major thing right now we work and we have a youth program we work the kids every wednesday carved a couple of dugout canoes which hadn't been done in 100 years and we and we have elders come and talk to them about the history and the culture of the tribe you know how we want to protect our treaty areas because that, that it's really critical to us as a people because we saw our first foods you know like the doctor was talking there you know a lot of the foods now are almost gone yeah. and we can't harvest them because of the impact with the timber industry cutting clear cutting you know and the impact with the dams on the salmon salmon are a critical part of our culture it's like something that is not we can't have them go extinct you know like they may be if they keep the dams and other um um plants and medicines that we gather, you know, traditionally I've been doing it a long time for generations. We're trying to protect those because we don't want to see, you know, and, and it is being impacted like the water on the rivers is being impacted because of the low snow melt because of climate change. And so that's going to affect the salmon, particularly because what happens is when the dams, they like to save that water in the reservoirs and they let it go to generate power. And so that's really bad for the fish because the fish are not part of that whole scheme. And so they're more interested in making the money off the electric generation, hydroelectric power. And so we have a number of issues here in um, our treaty area. And then we work with other tribes throughout the Northwest, Lummi tribe that are working with trying to protect orcas um, in Puget Sound, because the orcas, their main staple food is Chinook salmon, which come up here to our headwaters in Idaho um, to spawn. But now the native species are getting really reduced and, and there's a lot of hatcheries, like when they put in dams, they want to build hatcheries and hatcheries are really inefficient. They're really uh, not a good thing, but that's how they try to supplement the fish runs because the native species with the, that's that means the fish that are native to come up, used to come up here before the dams to spawn, lay their eggs, uh, hatch the, the smolts, they call them a baby fish, would, are supposed to be able to float to the ocean, not swim because they, they're not <clears throat> ready to swim. So they're supposed to float to the ocean develop in the ocean and swim back up to where they came from. But that native species are really diminished and now they have hatcheries. So they re basically release them from the hatcheries or they, what, it's really ridiculous. They release the fish from the hatcheries. They go to the ocean, they come back, they squeeze all the eggs out. They test them. They put all kinds of weird um, antibiotics on the fish. And so then it's kind of like this production of fish, you know, like you hear about these fish farms. That's essentially what it's like. And it's, it's really sad. 
because but our because our main issue is protecting the fish the salmon and we want to that's our big battle right now to get the dams breached lower snake river dams breached and to make sure that um we can protect other species wolves and grizzlies that are in our treaty area and so um but i appreciate you having me on here because i think uh, all these issues there's so many issues that are important in the world today and, and climate change is definitely in affecting you know the water the land and the trees and everything because water is so critical you know every 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 being needs water and so we're trying to work to make sure that we don't create a really um bad situation for the future for the kids that we work with 20 years from now we want to make sure that we did something active to make sure that we protect what they can be able to do in the future hunt fish and gather so thanks <laughs> Thank you so much, Julian, for, for your introduction and uh, your description of everything that's happening. And uh, now we're going to pass to some individual questions. And the first one is for Stephanie. What is the eel's journey? How do they fulfill the responsibilities to take care of the St. Lawrence River? So American eel's journey spans thousands of kilometers from the Sargasso Sea all the way to Greenland. And so many of those, they reach the St. Lawrence River as well as the Ottawa River Shed. And the ones that make it here and into Lake Ontario are a population of entirely female or almost entirely female eels. Um, they are the biggest of their cohorts, they lay the most eggs, and so they have a really big impact on uh, the species as a whole. Um, <clears throat> and so when we consider that there used to be such a high abundance, and so in the St. Lawrence River, they made up almost 40% of the biomass of Fish. So you can imagine as one of the most abundant large fish species in the river, how many people they fed, how much medicine they produced, how much control they could they could control as an apex predator, other species and make sure that they all stay in balance. They helped to purify the waters by eating carrion and other dead animals in the water. Um, You know, other really good examples of their role and responsibility to other specific species is with mussels. There are certain species of mussels that need the eel to complete uh, their cycles. For beluga whales, um, eels were a, a very important part of their diets. And at the same time, sadly, what's happening with the eels and as they age and collect uh, contaminants in their bodies are very fatty fish and that live a long time. Uh, they're bringing those chemicals back with them to other predators. Um, and so, for the example of belugas, they're finding high levels of myrex. And so, this has an impact on the fertility of the beluga whale. So, there's this interconnectedness that's happening and that the eels are, are, are carrying that I guess that violence with them back to the ocean, if they can even make it back to the ocean. Um, as part of their journey, and I guess this is going to come back up in in some question in another question that's on its way. Uh, they they have so many barriers, and and eels are such a they're such a crazy species. They can breathe through their skin. They can travel on land. They can survive massive temperature differences. They're almost like this, this fish that's so hard to kill um, and, and to see them at that 1% of their original population in the St. Lawrence River is incredibly tragic and, and violent really um, to see what's happening to them uh, in this region. And so I took some notes to make sure that I covered everything um, and hopefully I think I've almost gone through them. Um, but I, I suppose just as a note with the loss of the eel is a loss of culture, a loss of language, um, a loss of a food and important medicine, particularly for arthritis, the skins were used. Um, and I just want to take, make a note here that what I'm sharing and what I'll be talking about today, this is knowledge that 
has been shared with me from so many people. And I just want to acknowledge that um, just a few people that have been particularly important in, in my learning of the American eel. Uh, one person of which is Courtney Holden, who's a scientist who works with me, who did her PhD on eels. Um, one of my colleagues or a, a co kind of somebody that I work with also often is Abraham Francis, and he's just taught me about those relationships, the roles and the responsibilities. I think this has been a really important piece of what I know and what I'm going to be sharing today. Um, and just most recently, uh, yesterday, I was invited to go to a meeting, uh, kind of like a EO working group that included um, included a few not-for-profit organizations and scientists, uh, people from different nations along the route of the American eel within the Ottawa River Shed and the St. Lawrence River, uh, DFO, which is the gover a federal government agency in Canada, and uh, the hydro operators. And so we had this meeting yesterday, and one of the people that was there, uh, she is here, I'll find her name, and I'll share the link because I think if there was one paper to read about eels and to get all this information from, it would be this paper that she just published. She's, she's an indigenous scholar. She has eel clan uh, on one side of her family. Um, so it's the best I've read. So I, so her name is Leora Gensworth and it was co-written with uh, Christopher Bowser. So if you wanted to take an even deeper dive to learn about the American eel, I really suggest this paper. It's called An Angulid Lens, How Eels Reconnect People and Waterways. And so I'll share it. It's open source. Everybody can download it. And uh, yeah, I think I think that covers what I wanted to say. Thank you so much, Stephanie, and uh, for like telling us about the life of the eels and everything that's that's making it hard, if not impossible. And now for Diana, would uh, could you describe how do trees keep the world breathing and the oceans flourishing? Well, I want you to just think about trees, deciduous trees, and it doesn't matter where you are. All trees, but I'm going to put a Put a finger on this deciduous trees. Let's say the maple trees, the elm trees, anything that's deciduous. Think about fall. When fall comes, the temperature drops and the leaves fall off the trees. Actually, they fall off the trees in a fractile pattern. The mathematics of fall is actually a given for a tree, which is very interesting. So the leaves fall on the ground and those of you who've been children and who have children, you'll see that sometimes when it snows, the leaf goes right through the snow and there's a skeleton left. What comes out of this leaf, all leaves from these deciduous trees is an acid called fulvic acid or humic acid is another one closely related to, to humic and fulvic acid. It's a huge molecular compound, almost a million in its molecular weight. That compound goes into the water, water soluble with the rain, runs on the streams, runs into the lakes, runs into the rivers and goes out into the oceans. Now, Julian, this is where this is important for you. What this fulvic acid does, it's important to have forests near where you have, where you have your salmon. What this huge uh, acid does, it goes out into the water and dissolves. It is a chelating agent for iron. The land is rich in iron. The sea is poor in iron. The sea is always looking to the land for iron. When the iron is released in the waters around the bays and into the oceans, it is a catalyst for nitrogenase enzymes. In the nighttime, the iron triggers the catalase, triggers the nitrogenase enzymes to make protein. Anything that makes protein gets bigger. Anything that gets bigger wants to divide. And all of the columns in the great oceans where the salmon are going through, the crococales, the camasiphonales, the nostocales, 
all of the miniature tiny tiny species of algal as cyanophyta are down in these great columns separated by their own dna and what they do is they divide and they divide into two they have the iron there to make them strong and that from one species you get two species all of them bloom with this iron and that is the feeding foundation of the oceans for everything for every single thing for the orcas for everything in the ocean all the mammals in the ocean and that's how it happens so when you have for instance very dry weather which we're going to be looking at very hot weather when we're going to be looking at the quality of the forest goes down even if you take down the forest which you shouldn't be doing then you have very little water when you have very little water you have very little um, uh, humic acid and fulvic acid when you have very little fulvic acid you have very little iron so you have a famine in the oceans and that's what's happening right now we have to lay claim again to your forest is my forest our forests belong to all of us and they belong to the fish there is an old old saying in japan on the seashores of japan to catch a fish you must plant a tree and all the fishermen in japan in northern japan now are planting trees thank you so much diana for that and like the description of how the trees are connected to the ocean. Thank you. Thank you. It's vital that we you know this now. And now yes. a question for Julian. Who are the animals and plant gardens of the next Snake River? How are they doing their part to keep <clears throat> the Snake River thriving? So the uh, human garden, well, essentially, um, like I appreciate, Doc, what you're saying about the different impacts. The, the main Right now, what we're doing, um, the tribal members, our group, uh, Northwest tribes, non-Indians, NGOs are working to protect, like I said, primarily right now, the river. Because, you know, the impact, like, it's sad to hear, you know, like what the doctor is talking about, because there's a lot of other issues. Like we have four reservoirs where they store the water and there's talk, I, I, I went down to this one in the summer, I swim there in the summer and there's toxic algae blooms in there. and like where I live on the Pul on Pullman is called the We Palouse. It's uh, Palouse Poo. That was a tribe. Uh, the Palouse band was up here where I live now, and they dump all this fertilizer from the. It's all dry land farming. They dump all this fertilizer into the on the land. It goes into the river, and so in the late summer, the, you see this kind of green, really gross looking plants starting to grow up because all that fertilizer is going in there. So that takes up the oxygen for the fish, and so. Besides dealing with that water gets really hot in the summer because it's just like a big pool. And what they're doing is holding that with the dam for the um, electric, for the turbines. You know, they release the water, the turbines spin, they get electric. And so anyway, um, it's just like hearing the doctor talk. There's so many of those poor fish, you know, <laughs> I mean, the poor animals that live out in the woods because they have to deal with you know, like we can go out there, we can go home, go out to the woods, go hunting, fishing, gathering, whatever, come back home and we don't have these impacts. But what we see and what our group is doing, um, we did do a um, rights of the river, which our council, Nestor's Tribal Executive Committee passed, which was they're going to put the rights of rivers like the Snake River has rights, because right now, um, you know, Mother Earth has no rights, essentially, you know, like I said, the federal government dictates this. Well, we own this river. We own this land. We can go in there and cut wood uh, timber in the National Forest because the Forest Service owns this land. And so they don't they don't really look at how to does that like she's saying um, when you cut cut you go in there and do these timber cuts, even if they're not clear cuts, that affects the uh, what happens is that water drains down into the creek and it makes sediment. And so the spawning beds are really negatively impacted by where those fish can spawn. And so there's a lot of different fronts, I guess you could say, but we're working to make sure that we can continue and push harder, push back to protect the waterways and, you know, essentially get rid of the dams is a main issue. That's a major issue, getting rid of those four lakes, lower snake river dams. So our tribe's working on it. 
We've incorporated other tribes, Yakima, Warm Springs, up and down the Columbia River. That's what the Snake River goes into the Columbia. Then it goes into the ocean and then the ocean, you know, fish come back up this way. And so um, it's kind of a daunting task, but um, there's a lot of, there's so many issues that, like I said, you know, those poor fish, whether it's steelhead or salmon, that they have to deal with going through that, those warm reservoirs that are really hot in the summer. They're really nasty and all that fertilizer and the oxygen is depleted by all those plants growing in the reservoir. And so that affects the fish being able to get oxygen. And so it's, uh, but we're mainly our group and we're, you know, as kind of the uh, protectors of the water, we're trying to make sure that we do our part to um, whoever may come, you know, whether it's the federal government, the state government, because like I said, they want to have control of it. They think they own it and, you know, no one owns it. No one owns the forest. Like she's saying, you know, I think we have the third or fourth largest roadless and wilderness area <laughs> in the United States. And, you know, they always want to go in there, these local yokels, well, I, I, my father was a logger, he cut timber, I want to go cut timber, we need yeah. jobs, et cetera, and they want to go in there and cut all the timber, so we have to fight against that, there's a lot of groups that are fighting that also, and so anyway, we are working, our group and our tribe and other tribes we work with are working to protect the waterways and essentially to protect the salmon, because that's a critical part of all, all the tribes along the river, it's a critical part of the culture, you know, we have salmon ceremonies, first catch ceremonies, most of the um, ceremonies we have, we're having a ceremony up on the Selway Falls this week, Saturday. A bunch of elders, a bunch of people are going to have a little ceremony. And we have salmon at those because that's that's our lifeblood. Salmon are the lifeblood of the Nimipu. And so we can't have it being destroyed or um, decimated or made extinct, you know, because it's that's us. That's like, like we're a part of this whole deal. It's like I always tell people, we don't own the woods. We don't own the river. We don't own the land. We're a part of it and we have a, a authority, like I think there was something about one elder was saying, speaking for those who can't speak for themselves, the fish, the whales, orcas, the animals, the wolves, that they can't talk, but we can talk. And so we have to speak on their behalf to protect them. And we have to look at different ways to do that, you know, different methods. And so um, that's essentially what we're doing over here with the tribe and our tribal group and the young people are getting involved. So. I would like to see the I would like to see the status of your river given the same status as a human being. Yeah. Do what they did in, in New Zealand. And indeed yeah. the old laws, the the, the Banchankas laws in Ireland, in Dublin, are actually being shaken up again and they're looking at these laws again because they protect nature. Yeah. We actually, have to talk. We I have to do tell you, I'm half Irish. My father is Irish and my mother was full blood Nez Perce. So Ah you <laughs> one, one time one it's time I was problem talking. that I have. <laughs> here's, here's a little, <laughs> this one cop in Coeur Lane, he told me I told him I was half Irish and half Indian. He told me you shouldn't drink. <laughs> <laughs> I don't drink, yeah. you know, but it was funny because yeah, but anyway, um no, that's where we got our rights of rivers was from uh I think it's Earth Law Institute and like the Maori people have rights of rivers under some other um, some other countries that have, I think Ecuador maybe, but um, that's really a big deal. But here, because I was just talking to someone over on the west side, they call it, um, and they're trying to propose something through the um, Democratic Party in the state of Washington to push something through to, to do that. And I think it's really important, like our tribe, I talked to our council about doing a rights of nature over all nature, Mother yeah. Earth, but you know, they kind of said, well, we already do that, you know, so I don't, but I think it's critical because the rights of Mother Earth right now are, like I said, they're almost non existent. You know, they're just like, to yeah. me, the mainstream society makes everything a commodity, you know, like, well, we need wood. How much can we make off that wood? How much yeah. money can we make off the dams and the hydroelectric power? And it, it's more um, not concerned about the, species or the um, four legged is more concerned about how much money we can make. And if there's harm to animals or species, then oh well, that, that's how they, it seems they think. And so it's a big fight, you know, like I know you guys are fighting it too. So I appreciate your efforts in fighting because I know it's a big battle. A lot of times, a lot of antagonists that don't understand what we're trying to do, you know, like I'm not trying to have salmon to turn a profit or sell fish in a commercial fishery. You know, I just want them to be able to take some salmon so we continue our ceremonies of the Nimipu and not 
you know, and where's yeah. the salmon? Oh, there's no salmon. We can't, you know. So think first foods is one of our first foods, they call it. Yeah, yeah. It's a tapestry of life. It's the your tapestry of life. <clears throat> and if you start destroying it, you destroy. If I destroy your tapestry, I destroy everybody's because right. we're all related. Right. We're no, we're no different to one another. We're all the same, in yeah, my yeah. opinion. And, and it's yeah. like that. I was telling someone, it's just like that. It's kind of similar to that. I think John Don said, no man is an island. It's, it's similar to you can't get rid of one species and not affect the others. There's no way. And, you know, that's where we started working with the Lummi people on the orcas because we realized, you know, these connections, like you say, they're, they're always there. They're always going to be there. We can't have, you know, whether it's eels or salmon, we can't have, oh, there's no more eels because that affects other down the line, whether it's the people or the other um, animals and four legs in the forest. So we want to make sure that we look at it kind of holistically and spiritually. You know, this was like I tell people that, you know, the Pope said that, you know, that in the environment, Mother Earth is sacred, you know, so, you know, how can yes. people, you know, like say, oh, well, it's just really interesting. And but I think it's really important that we continue fighting because sometimes it is a fight. You know, we got to either get out on the roads and rallies or get out on the water and, you know, things like that to push the issue back because they're not going to go away. And, and, you know, if we stop, they'll just keep going. They, they'll keep you can't going. stop. Yeah. You just simply can't stop. Right. None of us can stop. We've got to keep going until we've got we've got something. And another thing I think we should remember is we have a spiritual world too, right. whether we like it or not. And the animals are part of that spiritual world. And we are lesser as a human being if they're not there. <clears throat> yeah, exactly. It takes from us. It takes from us, all of us, every single one of us. So thank you all so much for this amazing, amazing discussion sharing how we're all failing in some, many of us are failing responsibility to look after the more than human guardians of the natural world, but also looking forward to what can be done. Um, and speaking about what can be done, um, the question is gonna be, and you've all, all answered it to a certain degree, but just become, to be more specific, what do these more than human guardians need from us? What can we humans do to help them now? Um, and I'm gonna turn this question over first to Stephanie. So as I had mentioned as a kid, you know, walking on the side of the river, we would see these chopped up eels, um, didn't know what was happening. I went back to school and I worked for this uh, organization and regularly we would get uh, reports from the community saying there's eels on the bottom of the river, hundreds of eels on the bottom of the river. And so, Finally, uh, we saw those hundreds of eels and it was hundreds of eels. It was, I think we tried our best to count based on like drone footage and there were about 450 eels on the bottom of the river. When we took a closer look, about a third of those eels were still alive and either amputated, hemorrhaged or cut in half and still very, very much alive. And we don't know how long they survive at the bottom of the river. Now, this is not the first time anyone sees this. Uh, there, you know, Mohawks have been saying it for so long and nobody listened. There's a, a really uh, great article in, uh, what was it, the, the Walrus. I think it was the Walrus. And they had interviewed uh, an elder here. His name is Henry Lickers, and Henry said nobody listened. And so this has been a very big issue: is that's being ignored and on purpose. And there was uh, this wording that was used in that paper that I mentioned. Of I think it was a like silent violence. There was something. Uh, this what we're doing to the waterways. It's like being hidden that isn't seen to the majority to so many people only the people that are really on the river are seen it um and so i imagine you know if i lived on the shores as all the people who live in aquasasne live on the shores to experience these dead and dying and suffering fish washing up on you know on their in their backyards um and i think the way that we've 
failed the eels but in particular settlers and industry and government um, has been to work in silos there's absolutely no transparency i think there is demonization of eels as snakes so this like long history of trying to on purpose disconnect people from the eels um when we brought these photos so the ontario um so we we brought these photos to the Ontario Power Generation. They saw them and they often say, ooh, this is bad for optics because the eels and the piles that we're seeing now in the late uh, fall are um, mostly made up of stocked eels. And so they kind of diminish like that pain that they're going through because they're stocked and it's not the natural eels. And so they often use, oh, it's the optics, it's the optics. But I'm for me, I think of these stocked eels and what we're seeing now in the abundance and at the timing that it's happening as a reminder that those eels are still here and they're still suffering. Um, and it's almost like our chance to do something. And so, as much as we've been failing, I feel there's some movement uh, towards uh, doing better for the eels and towards understanding. Um, I think I, I try, I'm trying to stay positive and I am seeing changes um, within you know, the way that we talk about it. But when it happened, when we saw all those eels, we were so scared to talk about it because it's so political. It was so, so, scary and it took a long time before we we shared it more broadly um and i guess coming back to those photos i'm i finally kind of i haven't done much with them or shown them publicly just because they are so violent and is just trying to find the best time and way to do that without being extract like extracting um and so I'm going to be making those photos as a creative commons with attribution so that they can be used and shared as widely and as broadly as needed. So, you know, if there's anyone here who would want those photos, if you're doing a presentation or something, I'd happily share them with you. And so you can send me an, an email after. But yeah, so that's my I think that's my answer. And just to follow up with a very quick question, Stephanie, um, yeah. would you, you painted a picture of the present, of what you saw and how you felt at the present, but yeah. this is not a new story. The no. populations have declined very sadly over a time, a very specific number of time. Could you just give us a little backstory of when did the decline start and how that progressed? That's a really good question. Um, and I think like the main, like, uh, oh, it's such a good question. A bit of a, I feel like a tough one, but from what I've heard from reports and from people regionally, I think those declines were seen. I think it was like the late nineties, early two thousands based on a, there was a, a story of a commercial fisherman in Lake Ontario and he was fishing eels and he had, and that, that was the way he was making a living and he, <laughs> Uh, he went into the office of, I guess, the like the very, very well-known eel scientist, uh, Castleman, John Castleman, and he was like, there's a problem with the eels. And so I believe that that happened in the early 2000s. And I think maybe that had, yeah, I guess it's part of like their, their life cycle as well, that they live 20, uh, up to about 20 years. Um, and so, yeah, I'm, I, I think that's where the delay comes in. Um, yeah, I hope I'm answering that right. And, and, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. And just following up, following up on your answer. Thank you, Stephanie to Diana, you were sharing with us before the call, um, how, what is happening to the eels, the eels being chopped up in the, the engine turbines of these, of these hydroelectric dams, how this process is only one threat that the eels are facing. You were mentioning what was happening in the Saragasso Sea to the Saragasso, which keep, sustain the eels ecosystem. Could you share that with us? 
Yeah, first off, first off, we have to educate people. You know, um, you know, Stephanie, you know this material, whether it's horrible looking or not, it's a fact. This is what the fact, this is a fact of the of the eel's life, the life of the eels. That this is not a this is not a charitable organization. This is a killing system. I mean, you have to be truthful about it. Because it's a killing system now for the eels, but tomorrow it might be for you. I mean, these these are serious questions, serious things in nature that we're destroying nature. We're putting phosphates okay into this into the into the water, but we're also putting uh, pesticides, herbicides, pesticides into the water. They're killer compounds. And for a man, it means that one man out of every 10 men will get prostate cancer, or 10, no, nine out of 10 will get prostate cancer from these, these compounds. It's in breast milk, it's everywhere. So we've got to clear this up and it's education will clear this up. Now, going back to, to, to what I'm talking about, don't, you know, you're young, don't be a pussycat. You've got all, all of us behind you saying, go for it, girl, go for it. You have this information. It's a blessing to have it. It's a gift you're being given. You speak for the eels. And if they're getting chopped up, it's disgraceful. Disgrace the people. That's one way of getting them to stop is by disgrace. And we're all involved in education. We're all involved in trying to do this and have, a, have an example of our own lives. And what, what I was told by the prophets, which is very interesting, when I was a young child, the, five, the ancient prophets told me that the time of now is the time of the cockerel in the ancient terms of Ireland. And in the time of the cockerel, the children will be different. And the children will want to know about nature. They will want to know what is harming their future because it is very depressing for them to know that we are not doing anything. So all of us have got to work to the maximum of our ability to stop this. And then the children know they have a mentorship into the future. And I think that's very, very important and to stand up and be counted, stand up to the plate and be counted. Now, going back, going back to trees, I'm always looking for my trees. I'm always looking for the rare ones. And on my bucket list, I have one species that I would like to have. I don't have yet in my arboretum. It's called Caria tomentosa. And that, that Caria tree was used by the First Nations to smoke the pumpkins in a coal smoke, to smoke their fruits in a coal smoke and to keep them over winter. What would you do right now if we had a solar, not an eclipse, and a solar event? And we are actually expecting a solar event on the, on the sun, a big sunburst on the sun, and it might get rid of all of the electricity on the continent. How do you then figure out how you're going to eat? Because the First Nations had to do this for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. This is their structure of their thinking is using nature to survive. We would never survive. We would never. We don't have the trees. We don't have the species. And for you, for you and for all of you, there's one big species I'm looking for in the water systems. And I don't know if it's in Snake River. It's called Apios americana. And it is, a, it is a pea that grows this tall at the edge of the water. And it was like a turnip for the, for the First Nations people to cook it with their different stews. Once upon a time, I found one specimen of that on the St. Lawrence River. One. Nobody is looking after the botanical systems. Nobody. There's just one. So educate the children. Get it into the schools. Get the kids get excited. Look, I brought a whole pile of kids from one school on a dinosaur walk. And I got the, emptied the whole school on this dinosaur walk. And I talked about all the species that you in an ordinary place 
what they look like, what the dinosaurs ate, because a small plantain was a 200 foot plantain at that time. And the kids had a downright refusal. They went on strike until all the upper classes got taken on that walk, dinosaur walk. You ignite their imagination. These kids are smart. They know what they're doing. Get them going, get them steaming. That's where we, that's where we're going to win this game. That's how we're going to win this game. And you've got the ability to draw. You've got the ability to use all of your art. But well, that's another way to win the game. That's what I think anyway. <laughs> when it comes to education, and thank you so much. Thank you all to all everyone on the panel tonight who is speaking about education as one of these ways to meet the needs of the environment. I would like to then turn the word over to Julian. You all focus on education, both youth, but also elders and all adults within your community. How do you, how do you all use education to share the voice of these ecosystems and fight for whether it be salmon, whether it be wolves or the Snake River in general? Oh, you're muted, sorry. Okay. Um... Yeah, essentially that's why we do this kids program every Wednesday. We uh, like, like I said, we start with canoe carving because that's something that, and I tell them we only get trees that are down. You know, we don't go chopping trees down because we're an environmental group. You know, we only be chopping trees. But anyway, we taught about how, and really like we've been thinking about like another big issue is with plastics. You know, and I was thinking the other day about okay, what do we do? Uh, tribe tribe members before plastic, we use wood. We carve, you know, tools, utensils, bowls. And so I, I start, I'm going to start working on that because I think things like that, you know, where we look at ways that, you know, right now to me, um, we're kind of victims of the commercialization of the society, like all the plastic being put out. Now they're saying plastic is in everything, the water, the sand, you know, it goes into your body, goes into the everything. And so that's kind of a big deal. But um, as far as taking care of the, the river, what we, what we do is, like I said, we have these flotillas, we have education with the kids. We have get togethers on the river because I tell people, you know, you can have Zoom meetings. I'm not saying about this, but you can have meetings and a lot of environmental groups want to have Zoom meetings all the time. And I said, you need to be where it's at. You know, you need to take people, like she's saying, out in the woods to show them these are the trees. This is the land. This is where these uh, wild, these animals or these species live. Wolves, grizzly bears, deer, elk, they live out here. This is where they live. And so you have to show people that. That's why we're doing this thing up on the Selway Falls. It's a big Kind of a famous uh, falls for the tribe. We used to be fish runs, fish uh, jumping up the river, the falls, and so we we work on just teaching about primarily the like I said, hunting, fishing, and gathering, how we can protect those, and how um, what we need to do, and we educate people, particularly like on today. I went to the council about wolves because, like I said, we helped reintroduce them, and I said, well, we need to say something about the wolf plan in Idaho. They, they want to kill them all, basically. So then I got them going, and I'm kind of more like. Um, I guess like a instigator, you know, I, I like to get people going, you know, like, yeah, let's get out there. Let's do something like, I don't know if you guys heard about that Megalos protest we had in 2014. They're bringing those evaporators up to uh, be, up to the tar sand. They're bringing them through our tree area. And so we had a four days of protest to block them. And finally, the, the, they sued the state and then they couldn't bring them because it was affecting the Beaver Creek uh, tribal members up in Canada, you know, at the tar sands. And so we want to work with other tribes. And so that was a big thing. And then um, with the Frida Snake Flotillas, we have kayaks, Indian tribal canoe families come down from, you know, Yakima, Coeur d'Alene, um, Spokane, Kalispell. We get on the river and then we have banners say Frida Snake. And so we do things to get as much PR as we can, because that's really the way to me that you get these out there. You know, whenever I do these events, I say, hey, newspaper, we need some PR. We like to know what, tell people what we're doing, why we're doing it and why we want to protect these areas. And so education starting with the kids you know like i said 20 years from now i may not be here but i need to make sure i want to make sure that i tell the kids the youth about what's going on how they can take you know become active in the community and you know like they're right now like we're doing some videos with the elders about their like most of them are like 75 to 80 or so and so we're recording their experiences with salmon when they were little how they were different the wolves and the grizzly bear stories how they are part of our culture and so then we'll start showing those around and talk to the kids about these issues of why these species are important, like why wolves are important to us, why grizzly bears are important to us. And 
you know, how they're part of this system, you know, like, just like, to me, I feel that we're a part of this system. We're not the, like I said, the lords of the world or the masters of the animals. We're part of this. And so that's how we have to figure is how to protect these. Like I said before, the elder said, we need to speak for those who can't speak for themselves because, you know, you know, like whether it's eels, we have a lot of eels here and they don't come up here and they do live a long time. And then we had um, some um, sturgeon that are really live a long time. Some of them could live 75 to 100 years. And now those are really bad shape because of the dams. And just, it's just, and then you, over on the upper Columbia, they have the um, Hanford and all that stuff seeping into the river. You know, they're getting fish with kind of weird gross on them because of the uh, radioactive particles that are going into the uh, water table and into the river. And so we just try to have a kind of a full fledged when we have we have environmental conferences, we invite everyone, we have different speakers, it could be from the Columbia River keepers talking about the um, Columbia River issues, or it could be the orca people, Lummi tribe talking about the whales, the orcas over there or other impacts on, you know, we had people from Alaskan villages come down and talk about their fish that were being impacted like pebble. Uh, Pebble Mine, we had uh, Lindsay Leyland come down. She works for the United Tribes of Bristol Bay. So we're trying to get a broad education, but really we still want to focus on what's happening down here because, you know, this is where we live. And so I think it's important to work first on where you live. And, you know, like I'm on treaty area right now. The Pullman where I live is within our original treaty area. We ceded the land and retained rights. We didn't give it away or sell it or transfer title. It's we ceded the land and we retain certain rights. And so um, it's really important to me that we educate people, whether it's adults or young people, not only in what we're trying to fight for, but how to do that. Because a lot of the, realistically, a lot of the tribes um, we've been put down for so long, you know, decimated culturally, cut your hair, change your religion, um, you know, and, and just like push down and push down. And a lot of tribal members, I see the self-esteem, the the strength that they have is starting to come back. Well, we're trying to build that in the kids, you know, say, hey, you, it doesn't matter your background or where you're from or if you're a tribal member, you have you have the right and the ability and power to make changes because, you know, it's just like with me, you know, like we've been doing a lot of stuff and I'm not special. I'm just a regular guy that decided, you know, hey, man, people need to start pushing back, you know, because they're going to keep pushing and we just need to start pushing back and and you do hear a lot of, um, like our big wolf campaign, I mean, people in Idaho, they hate wolves, you know, and so they think, oh, well, the Indians want to save wolves, and, you know, that's right, we do want to save wolves, and so, um, but it's kind of, like, we meet a lot of people that are really supportive, and that when we have our events, I met so many people that, you know, I never knew before, and they say, oh, yeah, I'm really supportive of keeping the wolves, you know, so when you have events, summits, we call them tribal environmental summits, get-togethers, or like Zoom meetings like this, where you get yeah, people yeah. learning about the different issues that are going on, like you, you, you folks are back east. I'm out west, you know. I'm, you know, across the U.S. And so it's good because we have these common elements of what we're trying to protect: these uh, waterways, the fish, the eels, and the four legged that live in the woods. So I think it's really important that we just continue Zoom meetings, social media, you know, conferences where we talk about these issues. So, but I think it's really great. Thanks. Thank you, Julian. Um, particularly. Uh, for connecting, like, yes, these struggles, the, the nature, we're all connected. We are all, we are, it's a big <laughs> continent, but the struggle is the same. And yeah. uh, like uh, going on from the point, we would like you to describe how you worked with the tribal government to recognize the legally enforceable rights of the snake rivers and all nature. Yeah, essentially what um we started doing, like Elliot and I, we, um. He's kind of retired now, so he's kind of laying back. But what we started doing was with our tribe, like I said, my issue, even today when I was talking about the wolf issue in Idaho, it's all within our treaty area. It's in the national forest, but within our original treaty area. So I said, um, you know, our constitution and bylaws says a Nespers tribal executive committee shall have jurisdiction over all lands within the 1855 treaty area. That's pretty clear to me. <laughs> they may not think so, but that's what I believe. And so I think that we should have a say in what goes on, whether it's on the Snake River and the dams. And so what we do, what I did today is gave them a letter uh, pro, uh, against the state of Idaho's wolf plan. And they said they already had one, but I'll, so I'll wait to see. But my thing with the tribe is just to keep pushing the tribal council 
and you know, like I went there about two months ago, and then they suggested we have a wolf ceremony, which we did. A lot of the original people that helped reintroduce the wolves, a lot of council members came there, a lot of people from, and so then um, I went back there today and said, well, you said you're going to do a proclamation uh, against the state of Idaho, so where's that at? You know, I, and, and they know me, you know, they know I don't really, but one thing I found with whether it's uh, um, tribal government is persistence, you know, they get tired of hearing it, you know, they say, okay, Julian, and, and you know, now with our group, we have strong support from the tribal membership. We have about maybe 2,000 tribal members that live on the reservation, so we have a lot of support. You know, we um, work with the tribal membership at our general council meetings. We have two big meetings a year, and so the council realizes now that, you know, when I am talking, it's not something that is just like Ben or, or Julian. It's more like we have this group of people, grassroots groups that support wolves and support dam breaching, and so then then they'll start acting more because but that's how I figure it, be persistent. You know, it's like anything, you know, any goal you have or any idea that you have is whoever you are, you just have to be keep pushing and pushing and pushing because, you know. That's all they understand. And and that's that's what, that really what it comes down to be. Like, so like I told them people that when we do our kids thing, we've been doing it every Wednesday for about seven years. I said, we're there every Wednesday. People say, what time do you meet? I say, it's on our Facebook. We meet every Wednesday at four. And I tell the people, I said, we're going to be there. We're not going to be this, you know, like, oh, we're not going to be there. Sorry, got to cancel it. We don't do that. I told them, those kids, they want us there and we're going to be there. And I made the commitment that I'm going to be there unless, you know, I have missed, missed few. And so it's kind of the commitment. It's taking the protection of Mother Earth as a commitment and a responsibility or whatever it might be, whether it's salmon or eels. And then you just keep coming up, working with different people, coming up, looking at different angles. Like I started working on the treaty angle because we have the authority within our treaty. And so it might be a battle with the state, but oh, well, you know, you gotta, if you want something bad enough, you can get it, but you have to be consistent and pushing the issue and then it'll come to fruition. Cause it's a, with the dam breach, we're really making good strides now, but, and it's taken a while, but you know, it's like, I see it, you know, people say, well, yeah, this is a good idea. And you convince people that it's a good idea. And then they say, oh, yeah, that is a good idea. We should protect eels. We should do what we need to do to protect the waterways because climate change is here. And so I think educating the young people, we haven't gone really into the school, but I might start going to the high school to set up an environmental club in Lapways, primarily Nez Perce kids or a lot of Indian kids, and then work with them that way because then we can say, hey, we can do some internships, you know, working on the environment, doing wolf research or grizzly research or things like that, where we get the youth involved and then they'll want to go into these different fields, which a lot of them do. A lot of them want to study fisheries, biology or wildlife management. And so it's kind of like that getting them involved and interested in appealing of how important it is to protect the environment. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for everything you shared. And yes, the, the education is is key, but you also take the one step forward and you actually you work with the tribal government. You move you move things from like the rights of the Snake River or other things forward. Um, and in light of everything you just said, Julian, just one last question for you regarding um, the rights of the Snake River. And what rights does the Snake River have? In your opinion, what rights does the Snake River have? Right now, it's kind of intertwined with the uh, fish that live in there that the river has the right to live and flourish and be protected and have the ability to, and it's just like I say with the dams, it's, it's impeding its ability to flow freely. And we believe the river should uh, have has the right to flow freely and that there should be no man-made impediments that impact that because right now, like the dams or other things up, up higher up, the timber cuts and the treatment of the land or how they treat the land and riparian areas is really impacted. So we just believe that um, the river has a right as a, uh, to me as a spiritual in entity as a part of this. Like I said, we're a part of this. The water is a part of this. You know, the river is a part of this. The ocean is a part of this. And so we have to protect these because they do have, and the, the rights of nature is really a new thing. You know, a lot of people don't really know about it, but I think it's something that people can understand more, say, well, how, like this river has the right to flow. I mean, that's pretty clear. The river should have the right to flow, not be dammed up and mistreated. And so um, even some people in, in the country, they say, oh, well, you're worshiping 
mother nature, you know, that's, that's, not, that's not it. It's more just protecting a being or a sentient being that has the right to exist, just like the fish, the salmon have the right to live and flourish and travel up and down the river, just like, you know, we have rights to drive here and there or go here and there. And so the river, we believe is just as equal in our um, lives for that, the river to be clean, to be protected, to have the ability to flow freely and, and freely. And, you know, the protection, like um, doctor saying, is that all that, I hate to say it, all that stuff they're dumping in there, pesticides, you know, herbicides, they spray the roads on the side of the highway every year to kill the weeds and that goes in the river. And that's why I say those poor fish, you know, they got so much to deal with. But I think the rights of the river is to, the river to flow freely and to be able to sustain the life that it does and has, you know, prior to the migration, I guess you could say so. Thank you, Julian. The right to flow freely, yes. I hear all the rivers around here that are damn saying the same. And yeah. on that uh, on that note, uh, there's Stephanie. Uh, if hills are legally enforceable rights, what should they be? I mean, yeah, I think like Julian was saying, I think, you know, okay. If we look at eels and the amount of territory that they cover, it goes and you were to give rights to eels, it would it would impact the rights of all these rivers as well because of how many rivers that they use and how many lakes. Um, but definitely the big one is the flow, the right to flow, the right to connectivity, to access, um, and, and the right to clean water that's not polluted. Um, I mean, I think, yeah, and I guess like, yeah, and, and I guess like looking at how to do that and how to put these things in place, I think there needs to be greater transparency in government, greater transparency in industry, um, shared information, shared research. I think all these these kind of steps will help us get to those rights for the rivers and the eels and the salmon and the trees. Um, collaboration between everybody. And like you were saying, like for education to just like consistently and like to pick something and consistently push for it, I think is really, really important. And if we can do that as groups, even better. Um, and so that's what I think of when I think of the rights of nature and the rights of specific species or, or rivers um, is that collaborative effort between people to be able to do it. Um, I think, yeah. I think that's what I'd like to add, but I, I think Julian did, you know, a lot of what he said is what I wanted to say. And um, yeah, I'll, I'll end it there. Thank you, Stephanie. Yes, the collaboration with, we live, we work um, in isolation. A lot of organization, uh, the different governments, there's so much isolation why we, we need unity to, to help our neighbors and um, to, Close the night, Diana. In your opinion, what should be the rights of trees? Well, it's very simple. You ask somebody to stop breathing. Hold your breath. See if you can hold your breath for an hour. And if you can't do it, um, then turn around and thank a tree. Because your oxygen comes from your trees. And the trees also make water. The trees act as a food source from nothing in photosynthesis. It's very simple. If you take out down the great forests of the world, you won't have fish, you won't have salmon, you won't have, have, have the great whales, you won't have this. And fairly soon, and we're getting to that point where we are going to have a problem ourselves because we require a lot of energy. All of our green energy goes into the internet. <clears throat> we have not the capacity to produce massive amounts of energy without blocking all the rivers. But if you block all the rivers, you have poisonous water. If you're putting your water through water, uh, filtration systems to get clean water, you can't get pesticides out of the water. You can't get the phosphates out of the water. You're drinking it. It's going into your breast milk. It's going into your babies. And it is a cancer-causing material. 
These are these are doom and gloom compounds that will kill you. And then when you have a, an algal bloom on a river or even on the ocean, the algae is capable of producing very simple compounds that are neurotoxins. And your children should not be going in swimming in that water where there are these, these algal blooms. Do not allow the children to swim in there because some of them can become paralyzed. These are great lessons. When I came to Canada first, when I came to Canada first, I couldn't believe how poorly the First Nations were thought of here in Canada. I couldn't believe it because in Ireland, we love the First Nations. We just absolutely adore them. So here, but in the time I have been here, I've seen a big turnaround. About 10 years ago, I opened my garden because I've got a huge garden, research garden, also as well as the Arboretum, to the medicine man from Aquasosne. And no, Cece, Cece Michel didn't come up, but others came up. And I had all of my friends from the university, all of the other university wanted to come and meet them. They wanted to talk to them. They wanted to have a discourse with them. So the change is wonderful. It's phenomenal. And when I'm asked to give some of my lectures in university, I address the First Nations first. And the first time I did that was years and years ago. And the, the, the leader, the, the head of the, the, that particular nation was there in the audience and I didn't know. And he, start, he started crying. He said, this is the first time I've been recognized in my own land. I mean, I couldn't believe this. How could this be? You've got this wonderful lateral thinking. You've got all this ability to do things. No, I think we hold hands with you. You hold hands with us. And there's no you and us anyway. We'd sort this out together and just get moving. And I think you plant one tree per person for the next six years and we will sort out some part of climate change and keep pestering, keep pestering. Remember, there has been a really good win in Switzerland today. In Switzerland, um, the law says now that the, the future has been taken from the children and this is this has been deemed um, illegal. So that is precedent law. So it can work here in Canada, too. It can work in the US and it can work in Mexico. So just keep on at it. That's all you have to do. Keep hanging away at the drum. <laughs> That's what I do anyway. <laughs> and, I, and, and with regards to government, I don't have a very high opinion of government and of politicians. They're not of the best of men. I, I really believe that. Um, and I think that you just go sideways and you meet people who are very good and you get a pile of people around you who are really good people, and then you'll get something done. That's that's how you get something done. Um, and the the government does their do, do, makes their decision their decisions from uh, from armchairs. So you have armchair gardeners, armchair fishermen, armchair. No, get them out there. And show them what these eels look like. Show them what the river is like. And if necessary, push them into the river so they actually feel what they're like. So, I mean, this is what we have to do. We do not have much time left for climate change. That ocean is getting very hot. It is really, really hot this year. I don't know what to expect from this summer, it might be a killing summer. I have a cedar woods, I have 60 acres of cedar. And it's wow. dying because of the last six years, we've had super droughts in this part of Canada. And the next thing you have is fires. So they'll flash fire. So we've got to, this is no joke what we're doing. This is, this is real. This is real for us, for our children and our grandchildren. And so you battle along and I'm known as the bush lady. So I've got my second name as a bush lady. So <laughs> just keep going, just keep going. <clears throat> and for me, I'm probably better than all of you anyway. Lawrence, you, you, there's one thing that, that I do and to settle my nerves, I go and make myself a good cup of tea and sit down and think about it. So do that, do the same thing <laughs> and think about it. <laughs> hey, thank you. Yeah.
Thank you all <laughs> so, so much. Yes, <laughs> we need to make ourselves a big cup. <laughs> have, have liquid and, and think. But think in a right. positive way to, to for future action. Um, <laughs> I, I, what I'm hearing, Diana, is when you were mentioning all of that, I was thinking, I was hearing the for the trees, the right to breathe. Um, yeah. Because we all have the right to breathe, all as yeah. living beings. Um, and yeah. with, with that, they also have the right for us to beat that drum, like you said. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Who owns the atmosphere? Who owns the atmosphere? I mean, just there's a fairly basic question that you, who owns the rivers? Who owns the mountains? And there is a divinity in the mountains and there's a divinity in the river. The river also has its own life, its own beginning, its own origin and its own end. And it is a divine thing. There is, it can be any form of division of, of, di uh, of divinity. But in old Ireland, there was one word that was a divine word called Andhya. And Andhya was, was, was a word that nobody used as a name. It was a word, it was a state and a situation. And it's very close to the way First Nations think about all of the divinity of the natural world. Because the natural world is our teacher. The natural world speaks to us. If you are silent enough, it will speak to you in a voice that you will understand and you will understand it for all of your life. And that's that's what we're fighting for. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Diana. Um, <laughs> I, want, I want to leave some space for questions at the very, very end of the night. Um, thank you all who have remained throughout this beautiful hour and a half hearing all everything that you will have to say. I learned so much. Thank you. So I'm going to give everyone it's time to go around and have one last final word. Um, based on everything that you all heard tonight, what are you all walking away with? All of you as, as panelists, as speakers tonight, what are you walking away with? What do you, what do you want to do to help all the modern human guardians of the natural world? Um, I'm first going to turn it over to Stephanie. Uh, I mean, it's, this is really inspiring listening to Diana and Julian and also seeing all the comments. I feel it's so powerful to see how many people are feeling the same way and just how how positive this can be. And as much as it could be a really, we can easily, you know, have like this doom and gloom. I think uh, I think just being here together and having these conversations is is really positive and very constructive. And you know, in seeing one of the, I saw one of the comments from someone who said that they had worked a long time. Uh, as a grassroots activist and that they got went through burnout and I totally feel that I feel like a lot of people who care deeply about the environment and nature and about each other this happens because we work we're, we're just trying to make things better um, and just that she also you know, or they they said you know that they're inspired by this to keep going I think I don't know. This is just such a great moment. I'm so happy to be here and I, I appreciate you inviting me and I'm so excited about meeting Diana and Julian as well. This is uh, this has been a really great experience and hopefully to share a bit about the eel for anyone who wasn't familiar with them. And yeah, I, I think this is very exciting. So thank you. Um, and Julian, last final words in case you have anything you want to share. <laughs> Let me make sure I'm not on mute. So yeah, I really appreciate this. It's nice meeting other um, panel members, and it just shows me like I went back there, like I said, back used to this America, the beautiful for all. I met all kinds of people that were fighting. All you know, they're fighting for different causes, but it's kind of like we we all need to work together and support each other because that that's really how it's going to work. And you know, like I said, getting people more involved. Like I learned about the eels because we have eels here, you know, and on the west coast with our tribe and Willamette Falls is a traditional um, eel area and so it's it's really a big deal you know like and sometimes some of the species get lost in the you know the big issues and so I think it's important and I'm really grateful to be on this panel and to be able to meet people that are you know have the similar um, maybe not exactly but similar goals in protecting mother earth and the rights of the rivers and rights of mother earth because it's really important and we got to just keep keep doing it and like someone was saying about the um it does one time it was interesting this we had this group that came down the river they it's called a 
uh, source to see from the source of the snake to the Columbia. They went to the ocean, they're kayakers. And <clears throat> this one um, friend of mine, she said, well, Julian, what happens at the dams? They don't breach the dams, you know? And I thought, what? I don't think like that. You know, I think they're going to breach them. And that's what I think, you know, I don't, and you can't, and that's the thing I think when you're involved in these battles, I guess you call them battles, but you just have to think like, we're going to, we're going to get it done. We're going to do it. And because I feel with, you know, with the creator behind us, protecting us and helping yeah. us along the way through prayer and, you know, our tribe, very spiritual. And I go to sweat lodge and different ceremonies. And so we keep praying for the strength to keep pushing this. And I think it'll, it'll come to fruition because we're, we're committed to the cause. Like I know these two panel members are, you know, and that's all it takes commitment and, you know, keep fighting. And so I appreciate people that are involved in these movements because it, it, we can feed off each other, you know, like, yeah, yeah, I know what you're going through. I understand, you know, and so I'm really grateful for this meeting and for the people that attended. Thanks. That's the idea. I have one, one thing to say. I, I have one thing to say. I have a blessing. I have a blessing from the fifth century. It's gone. Is it? I have one thing to, can I say this? Yes, oh. yes, please. Yeah, okay. It's a blessing from the fifth century. It's a blessing from the ancient world. And it is, it is uh, con considered to be a mantle of protection on you. And I'll say it in Gaelic and I, I'll translate it for you. May the divinity of, of God be with you follow with you and may you have life may you have energy in life and may that energy bolster up your courage and keep you going and that's an ancient 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 prayer oh, i don't think we need to say anything else um, i think that's that wraps up the entire night um, thank you all so much for joining us. We will be sending out a recording of this beautiful conversation <laughs> and it's edited within a day or two. Thank you all. Have a wonderful rest of your night. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye.